And when I went out in the kitchen for breakfast this morning, my wife asked me, how are you? I told her I was fine. Then I asked her how she was, and she reassured me she was fine. When I got into the elevator at my apartment, the elevator man said to me, how are you? I said, I was fine. I said, how are you? He grunted. <laughs> when I went over to get my car, I said to the garage man, how are you? He said he was fine. He asked me how I was. I said I was OK. <laughs> so the question is, how are you? You all look all right. I consider it my bounden duty as a preacher of sorts to preach on the relationship between your faith and your health once in a while. And this is germane to the Bible because in 3 John, the second verse, it says, I wish above all things that you be prosperous and in health even as your soul prosperous. Now, there are two things wished for you there. One is health and one is prosperity. And prosperity isn't entirely on how much money you've got in the bank, but how much vitality you have in your body, mind, and soul. Now, I once knew a very wonderful man. He was born in Italy of a very poor family. His name was Antonio Siciliano. They immigrated to Brooklyn, where they lived in a very poor neighborhood. But gradually, they got a little more prosperity. And when Antonio Siciliano was about 14, he got interested in girls. And there was a sweet girl down the block that he worshiped from afar. Finally, one day, he mustered up enough courage to ask her if she would go with him on Sunday afternoon to Coney Island. This was a long while ago. And they went down on a streetcar, I guess, and he had on his Sunday suit. Now, in those days, everybody had a weekday suit and a Sunday suit. And he only had two. And this was his Sunday suit. So he brushed off a nice, clean place on the sand and put down a big handkerchief, which was wide enough to accommodate both himself and the girl. It was a relatively small handkerchief. And while he was sitting there trying to make conversation with the girl, a big bully came along. The bully was 13. He, Antonio, was 14, but the bully was bigger than he was because he was just a scrawny little unhealthy kid. And the big bully spit on his Sunday suit. And he looked up at him, and he knew that he couldn't handle the situation. And the girl said to him, what kind of a man are you? Why don't you do something about it? And he made a weak excuse. The girl got up and left him. And he went home humiliated and crestfallen. And in the little apartment, he knelt down on the floor 
And he said, oh, God, make me strong and healthy. And the Lord answered the prayer. He said, look at your cat. And he couldn't figure why the Lord wanted him to look at the cat. <laughs> but he looked at the cat, and the cat was lying there in perfect relaxation and repose. There's nobody that can relax like a cat. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the cat was startled. It arched its back and shot like a bullet. And Antonio got the message. Relaxation, complete health, and fluidity of body, mind, and spirit. Then there was a man in the neighborhood who was interested in boys, and he took Antonio with some other boys one day to the Brooklyn Museum. And in the entranceway to the museum were colossal figures of Greek warriors of antiquity. And they were mighty men. They had tremendous muscles which rippled under the skin, which looked alive even in the marble. And this little scrawny kid said, were there ever such men? And the man said, yes, they were taken from life. He said, I'm going to be strong like one of those men. The years passed. He became the strongest man in the world so that he changed his name from Antonio Siciliano to Charles Atlas. I saw him once at Coney Island, and he had a sign behind him that $1,000 would be paid to any man who could equal his physical prowess. They say that he could bend a spike with his bare hands. I never saw him do it, but they say that he could. As he grew older, he decided to help boys and girls be strong. And he told them that they must develop the quality of relaxation, inner peace fluidity of uh, motion and reaction, that they should keep their bodies clean, never doing anything with their bodies or taking anything into their bodies that was contrary to the Holy Spirit, because he pointed out that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which dwells therein. And he said, keep your mind clean and keep your soul clean. Charles Atlas died at a great age but I remember him as a shining example of what a human being can actually do with himself or herself. I look at you. You're wonderful. Your physical body is an incredible masterpiece. Look at the hand, for example. I could actually make a speech without a word.
What have I said? I haven't the slightest idea myself. <laughs> but you see, when you're making a speech or when you're listening to a preacher and he suddenly doesn't talk anymore, but he waves his hand, you'll know that he hadn't a thing to tell you anymore. <laughs> but look what you can do with that hand or your leg, or your brain. Ah, I wish above all things, says the Bible, that you would be prosperous and in health, even as your soul prospers. Now, it is a fact that we are all imbued with a marvelous thing called the life force. Almighty God who creates also recreates. And when the life force dies down, Life itself abates. So the, the wonderful key to health is to maintain the life force. Now, this is a kind of a new language, and I always hesitate to come up with any new language. Every new emphasis has its own jargon. And unless you're with it, uh, with the jargon, you, you don't understand it. Now, for example, I, ha I was on the, the Queen Elizabeth, and I got acquainted with one of the officers, and he was a magnificent specimen of a human being, especially in those white uniforms that they wear when the sun shines. Magnificent. And he was a very spiritual man, and I preached on the ship and made a lecture too. And I got inter he got interested in talking with me and I with him. And he gave me a book called Thought Forces. It was written by a man named Prentice Mulford in England in uh, 1913, but it's gone through 21 re-editions. And Mr. Mulford says, among other things, the material body must grow to be like the spiritual reality. Uh, what's that mean? He says spiritual ill health ultimately manifests itself as physical ill health and spiritual health ultimately manifests itself in physical well-being. So if you want to stay healthy to age 80, 85, 90, 95, 100, I knew a man up in Carmel, New York, was 102. And I said to him, Mort, how'd you get to be 102? He said, I kept myself healthy spiritually. And he died at 103. Well, I'm not guaranteeing you live that long, but if you want to, you can. And he goes on to say, you are part of God and have spiritual power, which, if cultivated and trusted, will supply all your need and give you perfect health and with it joy that you do not now dream of the source of all strength lies in massing your 
thought force. Well, I hope you understand that. I had a friend named Frank Beering, B-E-R-I-N-G. He came from the little town in southern Ohio where my family came from. He became the owner of the Ambassador East and the Ambassador West, two hotels in Chicago, and the old Sherman House. And I always stayed at the Sherman House when I was in Chicago because never once, as an old Lynchburg, Ohio boy, did he ever charge me for either room or meals. <laughs> Naturally, I stayed with him. <laughs> the hotel is torn down now, so I don't go to Chicago anymore. <laughs> Frank was running this hotel when he was 86 years of age. And it had about 1,500 rooms in it, many restaurants and all that sort of thing. And I was there speaking at a convention, and he had 3,000 people at this convention that was going off like clockwork. And I watched him walking around there in charge of every detail. I said to him, Frank, you interest me. How old are you anyway? He says, what's the matter? Isn't your room all right? <laughs> I said, yes, my room's all right. Well, he said, what difference does it make how old I am? Well, I said, I know how old you are anyway because you went to high school with my mother. Well, he said, then why'd you bring the question up if you knew about it? And then he came over, and he had a very rough way of being affectionate. He pounded me in the chest like that, and he said, son, and that went over big with me, believe me. <laughs> he said, son, I want to tell you something. Live your life and forget your age. And I said, how do you do that, Frank? He said, keep your body healthy. But more than that, keep your mind healthy. Don't hate anybody. Don't get mad at anybody. Don't dislike anybody. Don't resent anybody or anything, and keep your soul healthy by walking along with Jesus Christ. Now that was a sermon given me once by a hotel man who believed with John that above all things we should have our have prosperity and health. I can almost see a man walking down this aisle this morning. I've been here a long time, and I've known a lot of people. This man's name was John Riley, Irishman. Slender straight as a string, bright eyes. When I knew him, great big head of white hair. He was the oldest practicing physician in the state of New York at the time of his de death, at about 98 years of age. He had attended two presidents of the United States. I believe one was Grover Cleveland and the other one was William Howard Taft. Very distinguished man in the medical profession. And uh, he used to speak to me after services. 
and he told me that every day when he awakened, he had the windows up even in the coldest days of winter, and he would practice deep breathing, and then he would lean against the wall so as to get every organ in its proper place. Then he would run down through his body. I thank you, O oh God, for my wonderful heart. What an instrument it is. Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Year after year. Bless my heart. And then he'd go to his stomach. Lord, I thank you for my wonderful stomach. Just think of the intelligence that was required to make a stomach. Who would have ever thought of a stomach, oh Lord, but you? And I can eat anything. Thank you, Lord, for my stomach. And he'd go down, especially he dwelt on the liver. He said, that is the greatest organ in the body. I don't know about that. I'm not a doctor. But toward the last, he had a nurse come to church with him, a sweet lady. She loved him, as I did. One day, she called me, and she said, Dr. Peel, Dr. John has gone back to the father. He lay down this afternoon for a sleep from which he never awakened. But, said she, in my last conversation with him just before he lay down, he said, Mary, if I should go home sometime soon, you tell my friend Dr. Peel that I'll be working for him on the other side. Now, this man loved the Lord. He loved people. He was a skillful practitioner of the medical art and science. But he used to say, never carry anything dirty in your mind. Never allow anything unwholesome to occupy your thoughts. Keep your soul clean, and your soul will be healthy, and your mind will be healthy, and your body will be affected so that it will remain clean, wholesome, healthy, and beautiful. So, this wise writer called Third John knew what it was all about when he said, I wish for you above every other thing that you may be prosperous and in health, even as your soul prospers. That's the golden key to good health. Our Heavenly Father, this sermon is designed to help us all to live more creatively with 
vigor, energy, and marvelous joy. And the secret we know is a beautiful correlation of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. A wonderful key to health, prosperity, and happiness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.